to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank Decada Oncology for their support of the Myeloma Crowd Radio program. Our show today is the second in our update on the Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative, or what we call the MCRI. One year ago, we selected two projects to fund because we believe that patients can help find and fund potentially curative research for multiple myeloma. At the beginning of 2015, we created an expert scientific advisory board with some of the top myeloma specialists in the world, like Dr. Robert Olowski of MD Anderson, Dr. Rafael Fonseca of the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Guido Trico of the University of Iowa, Dr. Nupur Raji of Mass Ge- Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Irene Gobriel of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Dr. Ola Langren of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. We then invited patient advocates to join together for the project. Together, we decided to go after solutions for high-risk myeloma because these patients have terrible outcomes, even with the great advances that have been made in the disease. We also think that by addressing high-risk disease, the new discoveries will ultimately help all patients because we all become high-risk at some point in the course of our disease. And if we cure high-risk disease, it's very likely that we cure standard-risk disease. We called for letters of intent and received 36 high-quality proposals from top investigators around the world. Our scientific advisory board then scored these proposals and selected a top 10. We chose two projects to fund, and this is one of the two that we are now funding. We are so excited to announce that with your support to date, we have raised over $400,000 so far for these projects. It's just incredible. This is so fabulous, and we're so grateful to you. In 2016, we donated $100,000 to each project, And today's show is an important status update to see where the project is now and where it's headed. Additional funding will be given to the projects based on progress and need. Now our ultimate goal is to raise $500,000 for the projects. With your support, we could do this by the end of this year. So take a look at mylomacrowd.org and find the Donate or Create a Page button on our home page. You can join us to invite friends and family to make end-of-year donations towards a myeloma cure. Now today we have with us Dr. Yvonne Borello from Johns Hopkins. Dr. Borello just returned from ASH where he presented an update on this project in several sessions. So before we begin, I'd like to share an introduction for Dr. Borello. Dr. Yvonne Borello is Associate Professor of Oncology, Associate Professor of Cellular and Molecular Medicine for the Graduate Program, and Director of the Cellular Therapeutics Center at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Borello and his team of researchers focused on the de- development of tumor immunotherapy for blood cancers that use cancer vaccines as well as a patient's own immune system to fight their cancer. The particular treatment developed in his laboratory is known as T-cell adaptive therapy with MILS, which is called marrow infiltrating lymphocytes, which we will learn about today. He has broken new ground in the fight against diseases like multiple myeloma. Dr. Borello is a widely published author of many peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and a member of several national oncology organizations and professional societies. Dr. Borello is asked to speak regularly at symposiums around the world. He's received many honors and awards, including the American Society for Clinical Oncology Scholarship Award, the Johns Hopkins University Clinician Scientist Award, the Kimmel Scholar Award, and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of America Clinical Translational Scholar Award. Dr. Borello participated in a recent Myeloma Crowd Roundtable where I interviewed him about his MILS progress and the progress of his open clinical trials. So today's show was recorded at that event. Let's begin by asking you, Dr. Borello, to give an overview of MILS for those who aren't familiar with this idea. We have uh, developed this approach of adoptive T-cell therapy with non-gene modified T-cells that are coming from the tumor marker environment, which in the case of myeloma is a bone marrow. So we call these cells MILS, which stands for marrow infiltrating lymphocytes. And the idea is that T cells home to where they recognize what, to where where they are in touch with what they recognize. And so the highest likelihood of getting myeloma specific T cells in a patient is going to be in the bone marrow, which is where myeloma resides. And in fact, we've been working on this now for about 10, 15 years and have shown that if we take the bone marrow out from patients and grow these cells up, these cells have a heightened myeloma-specific activity. So that's the premise for clinical trials um, that we're conducting. And so the idea is that uh, for patients that are interested and eligible for the studies, 
they're undergoing a bone marrow harvest of around 200 mLs of uh, bone marrow, which is approximately about a cup or so, uh, 12 ounces or so of bone marrow. And um, these cells are then activated in the lab, grown up, and then they're given back to the patient in the context of a transplant. So in our first trial, what we showed was that there was a direct correlation between the ability to achieve a complete response um, and, and it correlated with the highest amount of myeloma-specific activity, which was encouraging for us because, one, it showed that we could, deliver, we could take these cells, grow them up, and that the, the in vitro activity that these cells actually generated then was translatable into an anti-myeloma activity in the patient. We are currently conducting a randomized trial, specifically in the high-risk patient population. And so the trial is patients that meet certain eligibility, which are basically defined by FISH criteria. So it's uh, 17P, 414, 1420, 1416, 1Q amplification. These patients then go on to get a bone marrow aspiration, and then they're randomized in a two-to-one manner to get transplanted with mills or without mills. So 66% get the mills and 33% don't. And then they get Revlimid starting at around two months at, at five milligrams, which is a significantly lower dose than is what's normally given in the maintenance setting, which is more around 10 or 15. And the rationale for the Revlimid that early on is really to sort of maintain this T-cell activation, taking advantage of its immunomodulatory properties. The funding that we're getting through the Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative is not to fund the trial. That's already being funded. It's really to try to answer a different question, which is, of the patients that are responding, can we identify antigens that are specific to high-risk myeloma, since this is what the trial is, and to determine whether we can then ultimately make that identification and then with that potentially go down to either developing either antibody targets or enriching for T-cells. Because uh, right now what we'd like to do is to sort of see what the long-term overall efficacy is of the transplant itself, we are in the process right now of still collecting a lot of these samples and have not actually started with this analysis, but hope to be able to do this within the next three to six months now that we have our first patients that are out about two and a half years or so. So the idea would be that within this next year, we would do this initial analysis of screening of, of serum to identify antibodies, and then once we have these antibodies, to then go through and to try to characterize the antibody responses to the T-cell responses, specifically in the patients with high-risk myeloma, and hopefully to see whether that is a response that is generated with the patients that got the mills compared to the patients that didn't get the mills. And so I think one of the, the, the several benefits of this trial are one, that it's targeting a specific patient population, and the second benefit is that we have this comparison between mills versus uh, non-mills. And one thing you mentioned on the first show that we did is that you're growing up these T-cells in the presence of a patient's own tumor. Yes. So do you want to explain a little bit more about why that's important or what you've, sure. what you've found so far in your trial? Yes. So what we've shown from previous work, actually, is that we believe that it's the tumor microenvironment that's actually very important in terms of maintaining the maintaining tumors alive, and that's clearly been shown, but also in terms of maintaining the, the T-cell uh, specificity towards the myeloma. And so we made, a, we made a conscientious effort in developing this clinical study to not isolate out the T-cells, but to grow the T-cells within the context of the bone marrow microenvironment, and specifically within the context of tumor, because we've actually done experiments showing that it's the presence of tumor that keeps these T-cells more tumor-specific. And so we did what we call crisscross experiments, where we took mills and grew them in the bone marrow, or took mills and grew them and isolated them and then grew them, or conversely took peripheral blood T cells, grew them in the blood or grew them in the bone marrow. And we were able to show that the best tumor-specific T cells were the, T -cell, the mills that were grown within the bone marrow. And then once we took them out, we lost a significant amount of tumor specificity. But interestingly, and I think underscoring some of the unique aspects of mills, Merely taking T cells from the blood and putting them in the bone marrow did not restore a significant amount of tumor specificity. So what I think this tells us is that one, we need tumor, or the presence of tumor will make them more tumor specific, but that intrinsically there is something unique about these T cells in the bone marrow that is very different from the T cells that are present in the blood that we believe 
is one of the major reasons why they're a better source of T-cells for adoptive T-cell therapy. Mm -hmm. And when did you start the clinical trial and when do you hope to end the clinical trial that so, you're currently running? Right, so the, this current clinical trial, we put the first patient on in November of 2013. The idea is that this is going to be a 90 patient, 90 patients are going to be treated. We are currently up to, I think, 74 patients or so. We have now opened the trial up at other sites, Moffitt in Tampa, Mayo in Jacksonville, and also Northside Hospital in Atlanta is going to be opening the study within the next few weeks. We, we've enrolled 72. Of those 72, about, I think, eight or so have dropped off either because their disease relapsed during the period of time or other things. And so we're, I'm hoping to finish accrual up to the study sometime at the end of this year or hopefully early first quarter of next year. And, what, and, and the, the first analysis of this is going to be when half of the patients are at least two years out from transplant. And based on our accrual, that, that mid-time analysis is going to occur in the summer of next year. Okay, and do you have to wait for results to finish accruing, or how does that work with clinical trials? Because I think one of the things that we can talk about is participation in clinical trials. That's what we talk about on this show. Sure. One thing that's very interesting about what we have, I mean, I, we don't have any clinical data because, I mean, ultimately, the randomized trial, because of the way it was designed, we're not going to look at it until we've met this 50% uh, patients are at least two years out. But the things that we can say is that we are able to grow the cells pretty much on everybody. We've had out of the 40 or so patients that have been treated with MILS, I think one expansion failure. And this is something that I think, you know, with CAR T cells, people don't talk about, or even with TILT. You know, what's the denominator of patients that are actually eligible for this? So our denominator is virtually 100% of patients. The other thing to mention is that it's a, it's a relatively safe procedure. The way we do transplants um, at Hopkins is we do them as outpatients, and patients get hospitalized if they develop some sort of complication. And the most common complication in the transplant setting is fevers, in the absence of white cells and neutropenic fevers. And what I can tell you that we're seeing is a higher incidence of hospitalization from, from neutropenic fevers in the patients that are getting MILS, and slightly higher incidence of, of rashes and of diarrhea. But all of these symptoms are self-sustained, and we have never had to treat anybody. So this is very, very different from the cytokine release syndrome that patients treated with CAR T cells are getting that uh, is often ending them up in, in ICUs, and that I think to, up until now has really relegated that kind of aggressive T cell therapy to patients that, have, that are multiply relapsed that have very few other options. If this data turns out to be positive, and, and as we're currently doing, that we're doing this basically in the upfront setting, I think this is one of the very distinguishing features of MILS-related T-cell therapy compared to CAR T-cell in its current formulation. And this might not be something that you're measuring in this clinical trial, but in terms of recovery from the transplant, have you seen a difference in patients that are on the MILS arm and not the MILS arm? And then do you also want to talk about offering the MILS if patients oh, relapse? Yes. So I think the, the recovery issue, I mean, the one thing that we're seeing is that patients that are getting the MILS, their immune system is coming back much quicker because they're getting an immune system. And so we're seeing very few opportunistic infections. And I mean, I think we can say that we've seen significantly fewer in the MILS transplanted patients compared to the non-MILS patients. Certainly quality of life, I think, is not something that we're formally measuring, but we would like to measure. But I can tell you that once the patient is about a month or so out, they're seemingly doing well. If they're doing significantly better than patients that haven't gotten MILS, I honestly can't formally tell you that. But the other point that you mentioned is an important one, and that is that this is a randomized trial where one third of the patients are not getting MILS with the transplant. But what they are going to be able to get are, is going to be MILS at the time of relapse. And the, the protocol that we are in the process of finalizing is I think also very interesting because it's different. The idea would be to combine MILS with PD-1 blockade and Revlimid. And this really, it builds upon several pieces of data. One is the fact that there is now evidence to suggest that, that PD-1 blockade alone does not work effectively in myeloma and that the only way that it does work is when it's combined with an IMID. But then the other aspect of this is that one of the benefits of adoptive T-cell therapy is that it allows you to regulate a lot of these components of how and when to come in with defined therapies. And by giving the trial that we're designing, we're going to be giving the PD-1 before we actually give the MILS. 
And so the idea is that we're going to block PD-1 on the T cells before they even have a possibility of encountering the tumor and therefore of becoming energized. And so we hope that that one intervention alone can even further augment the overall efficacy of Mills therapy, not to mention the PD-1 that they'll be getting you know, at every two or three week intervals post-transplant. You're looking for patients to accrue to finish up the trial. How, how much longer from the time you finish accruing patients until the trial is closed and then what's your next step? The time until it's closed is going to be in large part driven by events. So if, if we get a lot of relapses on the standard transplant arm and very few relapses in the non-mills arm, then obviously we'll get an answer much quicker than if it looks like that difference is significantly smaller. In terms of the next step, a lot of it is going to be dictated by what we see. I mean, if we see a dramatic difference, then I think the one thing that we're planning on doing would be to think about a phase three trial or, or maybe even trying to do something to get this into patients earlier. If in contrast, we don't see that kind of a difference, then I think we have to go back to the drawing board and sort of figure out what potentially went wrong and how can we improve upon it. You recently started a company around this idea, so it looks like you think it has a lot of promise in many different applications. Yeah, yes, it does. So based on this Mills technology, I'm a co-founder of a company that's called Windmill Therapeutics, and the idea is basically build a therapeutic platform around Mills therapy. For obvious reason, the myeloma program is the one that's furthest along in large part because that's the disease that I see and that's where we've conducted the largest number of trials. But we are also looking at examining these cells in, in a variety of other different diseases, in large part based on the biology of what the bone marrow is and what the T cells that are within the bone marrow can actually be. And so we're looking into a possibility of also exploring this in the solid tumor arena, which may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but is based on data that we are currently in the process of acquiring. I, I'm really hopeful that this will open up a whole new different line of research. Let me ask a follow-up question from what you just said. You said you're thinking about using it on solid tumors. So how does that work if you're pulling something out of the bone marrow and myeloma is a blood cancer? Are you looking at other blood cancers or for other types of myeloma transplants? We currently have a trial where we're, we're giving mills in the, following an allogeneic transplant, where in contrast to what the standard therapy is, that you would go back to your donor and get something called DLI or donor lymphocyte infusion. In this case, we're going into the patient and we've been able to show that we can take bone marrow out of the patient and grow up these T cells, which are actually of the donor, and in so doing, give them back a product that is significantly enriched for tumor-specific T cells and dramatically depleted of the T cells that would normally cause graft-versus-host disease. So the idea in the allogeneic transplant setting is that we would hopefully be able to get around the need for tracking down the donor and getting these T cells from the donor, but more importantly, eliminating the toxicity and improving the overall efficacy of this approach. We've shown, we have now treated about seven or eight patients at Hopkins, and what we've been able to show is that we're seeing no graft-versus-host disease. This is a classic phase one trial where we're starting off at a low dose and gradually increasing the overall dose. The first patient that was treated was actually a patient of mine with a plasma cell leukemia who got a very nice initial response that lasted over a year. And so now the idea is for her to go back on the trial at a higher dose and see if we can potentiate that response even longer. But as you know, an allogeneic transplant is really used more in other hematologic malignancies, leukemia and lymphoma. And so we have patients in those settings as well. The challenge with leukemia oftentimes is that when the disease relapses, it relapses very quickly. And so we've had problems growing T cells from patients in which the bone marrow is 80, 90 percent tumor leukemia. Whereas in the myeloma setting, it tends to be a much more slower process, and so it allows us a slightly easier leeway in terms of growing it. But nevertheless, this is a challenge that we can easily overcome. Dr. Borello, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited about your progress and your project and can't wait to hear more about your upcoming findings and we know we'll hear more about that in the future. Thanks for listening to another episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio. We look forward to helping you understand more about what research is happening in the new year.
Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.